right, I think we're going to get started, everybody. Good morning. Um, today we have three medical students, um, two of which are visiting us from out of town, one of which is from the University of Utah. First up, we have Eric Ostler. He's going to talk to us about statistical methods in ophthalmology. He's a uh, University of Utah medical student just rotating with us right now. So, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, so, like you said, my name is Eric Osler, and my talk today is entitled <coughs> Statistical Methods in Ophthalmology, Unlocking the Black Box. Um, so, I think that oftentimes in ophthalmology, when we're doing our data analysis, it's kind of like a black box, because we don't always know what's happening inside of it. Um, we sometimes will just present our raw data to the statistician, and he'll return the analyzed outcomes. Um, and if we don't ask questions, uh, um, and we, we may just assume that everything is correct, and this can cause uh, a systematic problem as the statistician has spent his time learning statistical theory, and we spend our time learning about the eye, um, and there's very little overlap in knowledge and interest. Um, this means that the statis uh, if the statistician overlooks some of the subtleties in analyzing ophthalmologic data and a mistake is made, there's no way to catch the mistake. So I recently experienced this while working with a statistician. He recommended using five different um, techniques to analyze the data before we came to something that was an acceptable outcome. Um, each of his previous recommendations were either invalid, um, inappropriate, or they were inefficient. Um, this is when I realized that there is a systematic problem, and um, it felt more like a guess and check than it did analysis. Um, and I didn't realize the extent of the problem until I began a literature review. But before I go into that, I'd like to just talk a little bit about some of the background information. I think one of the um, challenges in analyzing ophthalmologic data is that the number of eyes does not always equal the number of patients. Um, when this is the case, we're collecting um, two eyes worth of data from some of the individuals in the study. Um, this means that the data is correlated. So um, two eyes from one person will always be more similar than two eyes from separate individuals. Thus, this data lacks the independence to use some of the standard analytic techniques. Um, so some of these techniques that require, um, that, that assume data independence are the t-test, linear regression, and analysis of variance. So when using these methods, um, we can't have any data within one group um, that contains two eyes from one person. Additionally, when um, we have uh, a number of eyes that does not equal the number of patients, it's important to assess um, the level of correlation between the eyes. And there's a number of different methods that can be used for this, but one of the most common is the intraclass correlation coefficient, or ICC. Um, this ranges from zero to one, zero meaning that there's no correlation within the data, and one meaning that the data is perfectly correlated. So, and if this is uh, not measured or not well understood, there's a high likelihood of using um, an inappropriate or an uh, inefficient technique. Um, so now I'd like to just discuss a little bit of my literature review. Um, I looked at two different studies that were very similar. Um, one was Murdoch et al. from 1998 and one was Caracosta et al. from 2012. Um, these uh, studies both systematically reviewed publications from selected journals and they um, categorize the results by the analytic approach used. So despite being published 14 years apart, these two studies had um, results that were grossly similar. Um, so they found that, uh, these, that studies do not regularly assess the correlation of the data. They also found that um, many studies do not use all of the data available to them, meaning that they're inefficient. And finally, they found that there are a large portion of studies that use invalid techniques. Um, so here on the chart, there's, um, this is a chart from Murdoch et al. And this um, classifies the 79 studies that they reviewed. So the first thing I would like to emphasize is that um, despite the presence of challenges in, or in analyzing ophthalmologic data, there's only um, a limited variety of scenarios, um, as we can see here. Um, next, I would just like to break down this chart. Um, the first category um, is analysis at the level of the individual, and this is seen when there's rare diseases that will only present in one eye, 
or in cases when it requires two eyes to make a diagnosis, like strabismus. Um, in this case, the number of eyes is equal to the number of patients. The next category is the studies that um, only analyzed one eye from every individual. And there's a variety of methods that you can use to select this eye. Um, either random selection, you can uh, choose to include only right or left eye, or um, you can use clinical criteria to select. Um, these methods are valid, but they're oftentimes inefficient, um, and they can uh, cause an inclusion of bias. So the third category in is, is summarizing data, and you can either use pooled data or um, take an average of the results. This, again, is valid, but it's oftentimes um, inefficient. The fourth category is analysis at the ocular level, meaning that there's two eyes for every patient. Um, the first group um, did not correct for the correlation of the eyes, and this was approximately 20% of studies. Um, so this is an invalid technique, and it increases the type 1 error by 5 to 20%. The second group um, is a cor uh, did correct for correlation of data. This was only 3% of studies, and it was valid and efficient. So the final um, category is paired eye comparisons. I'm using the fellow eye as a control. This is a valid and a powerful method. So after evaluating each of these types of studies, I was able to construct an algorithm that simplifies the process um, for determining appropriate method of analysis. Um, and I would just like to walk you through this real quick. Um, we begin with continuous data. And the first thing we need to do is um, determine whether or not the number of eyes is equal to the number of patients. If it is, then we can use um, some of the standard techniques, um, meaning a t-test or linear regression. If the number of um, eyes does not equal the number of patients, then we have eye-specific findings. And it's important to calculate um, the correlation in the data. Next, we want to determine if the data is paired or unpaired. Um, if the data is paired, then we have a fellow eye study, as seen here. And um, we can determine if there, the number of eyes is exactly twice the number of patients, um, meaning that there's exactly two eyes for each patient. And if that's the case, we can use a paired t-test. If that's not the case, then we can use a method called mixed effects linear regression, and that will correct um, for the difference in, in patients and eyes. So finally is the case where there's unpaired data. Um, so there's more eyes than there are patients, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean there's two eyes for each patient. And this is where a lot of the research we do falls, and this is where it gets kind of complicated. And I would like to um, discuss three uh, types of scenarios. The first is um, when the ICC is equal to zero. This means that the data has no correlation, and if this is the case, the data is completely independent, and we would be able to use all of the data that's available. Um, and uh, because it's independent, we can use, again, standard techniques. The problem is this is never the case in ophthalmology. There's always correlation between one eye and the, and the second eye, so we should not be using this method. Um, the, the next uh, scenario that I would like to talk about is when the ICC is equal to 1. This means that the data is perfectly correlated and that the left eye is equivalent to the right eye. If this is the case, then it's efficient to um, discard um, one eye um, from the data for each patient. And um, this, again, will uh, cause independence and we can use a t-test or linear regression. This, again, is very rare that we have perfect correlation. Um, there are times when we would choose to use this method um, despite having an ICC of less than one um, and, and use maybe clinical criteria to select, but that would cause um, a loss of efficiency in our study. So the final scenario is when the ICC is um, between one and zero, and this is most of the time. When this is the case, we can correct for the correlation, and then we can use methods like the Wilcoxon signed rank test or the Mann-Whitney U-test. Um, so this algorithm is somewhat generalized, uh, leaving out some of the qualifying information, but it does illustrate a correct flow of events. Um, so I believe that using this type of a tool would uh, simplify the selection process and improve our understanding of statistical methods. I think it enhances our ability to design powerful studies um, by eliminating uh, potentially all of the invalid studies and optimizing inefficient studies. Um, and allowing us to use more of our collected data. I think this would also improve our ability to discuss our results and interpret the results of other studies. Um, and this will 
help us better understand the strengths and weaknesses um, and prevent uh, potential bias in our studies. Um, and most importantly, we don't have to uh, learn anything about statistical theory. Um, so just as a side note and so that you're all aware, um, the Study Design and Biostatistics Center has a multi-user license of Stata, which is a data analysis and statistical software. Um, I was able to get a copy of this from, from them and it's now available um, in the library on the fifth floor. Um, so these are my references. Um, thank you for your time and for the opportunity to speak today. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yes, Dr. Olson. So it's interesting that uh, because you know a lot of us are a little uncomfortable with the, the core math, that, that the really simple mistakes happen over and over again. Another one is if you say something is indifferent because it's not statistically different, and the real answer is we didn't have the power to study it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, and I, I think that's why it's important to, to be able to use this correlation, because if it allows us to use more of our data, then it will increase the power, um, which is something that we're not doing right now. When we have to discard data, we lose that power, um, and we'll fail to, to show that difference. Yes? Where did you get the ICC from? Can I just make it up? No, it's, it's actually, um, th I th there's, well, it's shown in a few different papers how to find that. I didn't um, put the equation up, but it's very simple. Is it something like trauma? Mm -hmm. We would assume that that's going to be have no correlation side to side, and that's kind of just straight on. Mm -hmm. For genetics, it's going to be always an ICC of one. It seems like almost every other disease is going to be some combination of biologic predisposition plus exposure and slope. Yeah. Um, and and, and that's what we're looking at. Um, maybe I didn't make this clear. The, the intraclass correlation, it's looking at the correlation between eyes and one individual. Um, so some factors are, are more closely related than others, but um, in general, we can find um, how closely the data is related. Oops. Yes? Very interesting. I'll have to look into that. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you very much.